Thank you. Uh, it is a pleasure to be able to uh, talk uh, to you about the additive manufacturing of ceramics. And this is just an introductory talk. And I will be giving some uh, examples of different manufacturing technologies. So it, it will be mainly all about processing of uh, ceramics. And thinking of the uh, shaping of materials, uh, there are of course three basic principles. Uh, one is the so-called formative shaping, such as forging, bending, casting, and of course, not all, not all of these are applicable to ceramics. And then you can have subtractive shaping, and these are indeed applicable to uh, all applicable to ceramics, either in the um, before sintering or after sintering. And then there is this new form of shaping of materials, which is additive uh, shaping or additive manufacturing. And additive manufacturing is based on uh, the joining of materials to generate parts for the model data. And typically this is made in a layer upon layer fashion. And this is uh, very different, of course, from subtractive manufacturing and formative manufacturing technologies, such as the ones that I uh, listed uh, um, before. And just on a historical note, uh, the beginning of the um, field, uh, at the beginning of the field, the name was rapid prototyping because the idea was that um, people needed a technology to be able to generate a prototype uh, quickly uh, without using tooling, for instance, uh, without having to generate molds. And then people realized that they could actually not just make prototypes, but they could make products. So the technology has uh, long advanced uh, since then. And 3D printing is another very generic term, but I would uh, advise you to use the more uh, appropriate term of additive manufacturing to encompass all the different technologies that I will be describing. And these uh, technologies have been um, regulated under the uh, ISO ASTM standard on the top right of the slide. You can see there, uh, this is still currently being revised and becoming more and more complicated. But the uh, advantage of this standard is that it divides the um, additive manufacturing technologies into seven different categories. And they are as follow, follows, sheet lamination, powder bed fusion, directed energy deposition, material jetting, binder jetting, that photopolymerization and material extrusion. Actually, if you look at the standard, they make a distinction between additive manufacturing technologies for metals, additive manufacturing technologies for polymers, and they have a little chapter on additive manufacturing on ceramics. But probably the people that uh, contributed to the standard were not experts in ceramic additive manufacturing, so they list only a few of those technologies. Um, all of these, all the, all of the technologies above can be applied to uh, ceramics materials, to ceramic materials. And I would like to distinguish uh, between these different technologies based on um, the fact that they could either be so-called indirect additive manufacturing technologies or direct additive manufacturing technology. And the difference is that for indirect additive manufacturing, First, a layer of material is deposit, deposited, then the cross-section, the slice, the part is inscribed in the layer, and then the excess material surrounding the part is removed to release the final object. And you can see the occurrence for different types of um, technologies that I will be describing in a moment. With direct additive manufacturing, uh, instead, the material is directly deposited only in the position given the desired shape of the final object. So this is uh, fundamentally different. And of course, as in most cases, there are advantages and disadvantages to both uh, approaches. So all the technologies can be further divided into these two main uh, categories. So let me just, uh, in a kind of random order, uh, discuss uh, in detail different, uh, the different technologies. And I will start from that photopolymerization, which is a rather general term. 
that uh, has inside uh, that groups inside both uh, so-called digital light processing or DLP and uh, SLA, which would be stereolithography. And the difference uh, between DLP and SLA is simply the uh, light source for uh, and the way you provide uh, radiation to your material in order to make it uh, polymerized through radiation. SLA uses uh, a laser beam, so it's a continuous uh, pattern uh, path uh, point um, a point based path continuous. And DLP rather shines a full image of the slice that you want to embed into your material. So the basic working principle for both uh, technologies is selective curing, meaning cross-linking of a polymeric resin by means of an energy source. And you can have so-called bottom-up or top-down geometries depending on where the light source is with respect to the uh, component that you're building. It, is, it should be noted that uh, there are uh, advancements in the technology that allow now for continuous printing. So this is something that is quite uh, interesting because it can provide uh, fast uh, manufacturing. So what does it have to do with ceramics and the fact of you, uh, using a, a photocurable uh, system, polymeric system? Well. A typical uh, mixture that would be photocurable uh, needs to contain, first of all, photocurable monomers or oligomers, then a photo initiator in order to start the, uh, the cross-linking uh, reaction, a photo absorber that serves the purpose typically of controlling the penetration depth of the light inside the vat, inside the liquid. Often you have a, a diluent, uh, often reactive, and then you need to add your ceramic powders, or you can have a ceramic precursor, uh, such as a pre-ceramic polymer or salt gel materials. And you can also have additives. Add additives. So you shine your light to your uh, um, suspension, and typically you need to have a, a highly filled suspension in order to uh, generate a green part uh, with some mechanical uh, strength. Then you debind the green part to burn the organics and you produce a so-called ground part. This is the critical step because uh, you need a, a, quite a lot of uh, polymeric material in order to um, have a continuous polymeric network after cross-linking. So this uh, can lead the uh, debinding to uh, defects because of uh, high volume of gas release. And then you sinter your part to your final uh, ceramic uh, component. And you have some problems with this technology uh, because the, um, your, uh, the radiation is scattered by the particles. So typically you need to find a index, index matching between the uh, polymeric material and the particles. And some particles, for instance, silicon carbide, silicon nitride, uh, they are quite absorbing uh, of the radiation. This means that you can only cure very thin layers, something like 10 microns. And this is uh, very, not uh, very um, promising because uh, it takes too long to generate a component. Uh, furthermore, uh, other problems uh, another problem is the fact that um, you need to have a homogeneous and stable dispersion of particles. Uh, everybody working in uh, ceramics knows that this is uh, possible to achieve with uh, water-based um, systems, slurries, using appropriate additives, but in a non-aqueous medium like a um, monomer or oligomer uh, system, this is much more difficult, but people are working towards that. You can see some examples here of uh, components that can be printed. Uh, Litot is an Austrian company that uh, makes uh, very nice equipment for the manufacturing of uh, ceramics using uh, DLP. And you can see that you have a great degree of freedom in the type of the components that you can print. Another uh, technology 
uh, is the uh, so-called bind injecting. This is based on um, having a bed of powder that is deposited using a recoder. Then you have a printing head that selectively uh, deposits a binder that binds the powders together. And then you have the lowering of the powder bed and then you spread on top another layer of powder and you do this until you finish uh, building your component. And this technology um, requires the so-called flowability of the powders. If you uh, try, for instance, to spread a li layer of uh, powder, you can easily realize that in order to have a defectless layer, you need uh, a special property for the powders, that is the flowability, uh, which can be quantified and controlled based on the composition of the powders, the surface charges, but also the, the size of the particles. And in particular, fine particles tend to flow poorly, especially ceramic particles. So one feature of this technology is that um, the, in order to have a proper layer of powder that you can then inscribe, you need to have coarse powders, meaning of the order of, uh, let's say, um, five to uh, 100 microns or five to 60 microns. And if you try then to sinter such particles that, have, that are rather coarse, then you have uh, the problem that you, it is very difficult to reach full density for the component. And of course, you, you want to have a proper layer of powder because if you start generating a ceramic component with, uh, from a, a powder bed that has defects, then those defects will remain embedded in your final part, uh, of course, compromising the problem. One advantage of this approach is that you can have very large scale uh, printing. Um, and there are some companies like uh, Foxeljet in um, Germany that have a, a printer uh, that can print sun casting cores uh, that are uh, up to a few meters in size. The binder that you are selectively depositing from the printing head. Um, um, can be either a solvent in which a polymer is dissolved, this is the uh, most common approach, or you can put a, 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 sol a soluble polymeric binder powder mixed within the ceramic powder, and then you're uh, simply printing up your solvent, or you can uh, use uh, as a printing liquid something that would induce a setting reaction in the ceramic material. For instance, we are working with geopolymers, that are bicomponent uh, materials. We have a solid part and a liquid part. The solid part is an aluminum silicate reactive powder, and the liquid part is an um, alkaline solution. So we are printing uh, using this reactive liquid, and it works uh, pretty well. You can see some examples of some kind of casting cores made by uh, with this technology. And uh, people, for instance, in Schunk, they uh, are generating um, components based on silicon carbide. Um, as I mentioned, the, uh, after sintering uh, with this approach, it's very difficult to achieve full density, but then you can, for instance, infiltrate with molten silicon, and then in this way, you can have a high performance, full density uh, component. Uh, this is a heat exchanger. You, once again, you can see the degree of freedom in the shape uh, that is afforded by active manufacturing. Uh, people are working with this approach uh, to uh, fabricate bioceramics. In this case, by, um, in this specific, for this specific application, the presence of uh, porosity, residual porosity, is not detrimental to the properties, but is actually beneficial because you have a higher um, possibility of attaching cells to the scaffolds. Inkjet printing is another 
technology class. Um, in, and the basic working principle, you have droplets of the building material that is uh, that are selectively deposited. So the difference with binder jetting is that with binder jetting approach, you are simply uh, jetting a binder, uh, and it can be reactive. But in this case, with inkjet printing, you are actually spraying. You are actually jetting uh, your building material. And uh, there has been a lot of work on making ceramic inks uh, for printing on tiles, for instance, digital printing on tiles. And this technology has been uh, further developed for um, additive manufacturing. And I would like to mention XJet from Israel, uh, which is working um, on this technology. The, uh, they are using nano-sized particles. So the problem is, uh, of course, to have the correct uh, type of particles for uh, flowing through uh, thin, uh, narrow nozzles. But uh, the, um, there are also uh, people at IKTS in Dresden working on thermoplastic 3D printing, and they can use uh, micron-sized particles to generate also uh, multi-component uh, materials and materials with uh, a graded composition. You can see here to the right some examples of such components developed at uh, IKTS. And these are um, some uh, components by, made uh, by inkjet prototyping process. Powder bed fusion uh, is of course very famous for uh, metal particles uh, because you can either melt or you can sinter the metal particles uh, with um, very conveniently. Uh, there is good absorption from the uh, laser beam, uh, laser radiation, and also uh, high thermal conductivity, so there's no thermal shock. The problem for ceramics is that um, you can, in theory, reach, well, in practice also, uh, find ways of um, heating up your material to either centering or partial melting in order to consolidate the powders. But the problem is that it is very difficult to obtain defect-free ceramic parts using this approach. And the problem is mainly uh, thermal shock. You can see here, so for instance, some cracks, residual porosity. So uh, people, for instance, at the Belgian Ceramic Center have been quite su successful in generating complex shapes using this approach, but it is difficult to have ceramic parts defect-free and full density, which is, of course, what you uh, would like to have in mo for most applications. And the problem with laser is the uh, high concentrated power and uh, thermal shock that comes uh, with the technology. So this is, I would say, the least successful technology so far for uh, ceramic materials. Material extrusion is a, um, another suitable approach for uh, ceramic materials. You can either have the so-called fused deposition modeling, which would be your typical plastic printer approach. But in this way, the, in, in the, for ceramics, the filaments contain um, ceramic particles. So you can imagine that in order to have a spool uh, based on the polymer containing ceramic particles, you need a lot of um, plastic material, and then you have the debinding problem. Uh, but this approach has been uh, validated. You can, uh, the printer is very cheap, you can make components. And a, a little bit uh, better approach is to use the so called direct inviting, it's also called robocasting. And in, in this way, you generate a so called ink, a paste that you extrude through nozzles and you can generate uh, complex patterns. Uh, please note that with this approach, um, you have to mainly follow a continuous path. Uh, so this provides some limitations in terms of the geometry of the component that you want to build. In order to have a successful uh, printing, for instance, here you can see some uh, suspended features. And in order to avoid sagging of these features after printing, you need to generate an um, ink that has an optimized uh, rheology. This is called the Herschel-Bulkley fluid. Uh, 
where you have a yield stress, then you have a pseudoplastic behavior. Basically, uh, your ink should behave like uh, toothpaste. When you deposit, when you squeeze the toothpaste, the viscosity decreases, uh, the, the paste comes out of the tube, but then when it is on the bristles of, on your, your brush, it doesn't penetrate because the viscosity uh, with low shear stress or no shear stress increases. And this allows you to retain the uh, shape after extrusion. And you can achieve that, this control of the urology, either through evaporation of the solvent, or you can uh, work with uh, coagulation of the suspension, or you can use uh, either thermal or uh, physical reversible gels. For instance, fume silica forms a reversible gel with pseudoplastic rheology. You can see here um, an example of an ink that was not optimized, no problems for the control of the shape of the XY plane, but in the Z plane, you can see the, uh, the deformation, the sagging of the structure, uh, because the, uh, um, the material didn't have a, a, a pseudoplastic, uh, enough pseudoplastic behavior, but after optimizing, the uh, ink, you can see that you can retain the porosity uh, also in the Z direction. The last technology, uh, which uh, I would say is not really much used, it, it, it is one of the first technologies that was tested, is the so-called laminated object manufacturing. And here you have uh, sheets of a material that are selectively cut, typically using a laser, and they're bonded, typically thermally, to form an object and you end up with defects of intersection between sheets and also you have quite a lot of limitation in terms of the shape of the final objects so these are let's say 3d but let's say they are two and a half d uh, structures um, that have been uh, generated so lom is also a technology that is not really from uh, giving the, uh, all the benefits of additive manufacturing. So here are a couple of slides that uh, try to summarize the advantages and disadvantages of uh, individual technologies in comparison to each other. So indirect additive manufacturing technologies, they provide a higher speed, of course, in comparison to uh, direct additive manufacturing technologies. They have a simpler rheology requirement. They have a higher design flexibility, but have some limitations in terms, in terms of the material that can be used. Uh, you can use fillers, for instance, that can absorb heat uh, for um, SLM or SLS. And they also have some disadvantages, uh, poor adhesion between the layers, higher residual porosity, lower spatial flexibility, and it's difficult to have uh, achieve good flowability for uh, the powers. Direct additive manufacturing technologies, they provide better addition between layers, higher packing densities, higher green densities, and these, of course, uh, these characteristics lead to uh, the possibility of achieving fully dense ceramic materials, components, and they typically have larger printing envelopes. Sometimes they're limited by short reaction times, limited complexity with our support materials, and uh, heat de development can also cause issues. So here is another uh, comparison table between different technologies. I'm not going through all the details, but of course, when you're thinking of comparing different technologies, additive manufacturing technologies, you, get, you have to look at the printing envelope, so the maximum size of the component that you that you can generate, then the resolution um, or the, the minimum feature that you can uh, generate. You need to look at the uh, total printing time, uh, including uh, not just manufacturing, but also debinding and sintering. Uh, for instance, for, for, for photopolymerization, some people take also, uh, up to seven days for debinding in order to get a component that doesn't have defects. And so when you compare um, uh, technologies, you have to take uh, to uh, keep this, all these different things in mind.
So in comparison, uh, and in summary, liquid or paste-based technologies can use finer sonic particles, can achieve higher packing densities, so it's possible to sinter to a high density. Uh, while for powder-based technologies, you have residual porosity. For some applications, this is uh, desired. For other applications, it might not be. Uh, but you can also use post filtration in order to increase the, uh, reduce the final porosity. So there are still some challenges for additive manufacturing of uh, ceramics. And uh, for every approach is not perfect. For instance, um, these are some of the challenges that I already discussed. And in terms of the future, uh, it should be noted that there is a continuous uh, for, uh, development of technologies. For instance, now people are working on uh, making uh, or uh, developing technologies that allow you to have multi-material uh, production. People are working on making uh, continuous printing. People are working on uh, being able to add not just short fibers, but also continuous fibers to, um, to generate uh, ceramic matrix composites. And uh, so there's, uh, the field is continuously developing. There is interest in increasing the resolution. Uh, I haven't mentioned some technologies like true photon polymerization that would allow you to have a sub micro resolution. Um, people are working on hybrid technologies, so combination of technologies. Uh, I, I guess the, the main uh, point that I would like to make with this talk is not just uh, illustrate different technologies, but um, try to sensitize you to the fact that when you are considering using additive manufacturing, you should select the most appropriate technology for the produ production of the component that you want to generate. Because not all technologies can generate all shapes and some technologies are better than other, uh, other ones for generating specific um, geometries. Another uh, further development is large-scale printing. People are printing concrete now. They can print uh, houses, uh, and uh, especially for powder bed uh, printing, you may have components that are meters uh, in size. And the last point that I would like to make is that if you are considering using additive manufacturing, you should now uh, start using the so-called DFAM, Design for Additive Manufacturing Approach. So rather than simply thinking of a component with a, let's say, generic and standard shape, and you simply use additive manufacturing to generate it, you should a priori uh, design an architecture that would uh, enhance, for instance, a combination, simultaneously enhance a combination of all properties. And this is really a good way of exploiting the uh, potential of additive manufacturing. And additive manufacturing, and I'm closing, uh, is not just uh, a fancy way of processing. It is now being implemented by uh, several companies. So um, even people working with ceramics have to start thinking that the uh, components that they would like to use are no longer bound by standard technologies in terms of shaping. So you can start becoming creative in terms of the shapes and the architectures that you want to exploit for improving your final product. And with this, I think I exceeded your patience and my time, and I'm open for uh, questions.